So I am Richard Young and uh, I work for IBM Research. Today I'm going to be talking to you about machine learning in the browser and why we'd want to do machine learning in the browser. Obviously we all know it's because JavaScript is really good with maths. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and keep it at quite a basic level. So this is very intro to machine learning. So if you are a, an expert at machine learning, um, this, this might be a little bit below your level. But I'm hoping that the demos will still be kind of interesting. So uh, stick around. Hopefully, you'll still be entertained. So when we talk about machine learning, what do we mean? So this is Arthur Samuel. Um, I'm pretty sure there was better quality cameras around in 1959, but apparently the one that they chose to put on Wikipedia um, it's not such a great photo. Anyway, he coined the term machine learning. And he said machine learning gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. So what does that mean? It means that if we've got a bunch of if statements, for loops, while loops, things like that, we're explicitly programming what we want the outcome to be. Machine learning is where we've got some sort of system or black box where we've got data and an expected outcome. We give it the data or train it. And once it's been trained, it can then look at data that it hasn't seen before and try and give some kind of prediction out of it. So how do we teach a machine? Here's a, a good example. Let's assume we've got some kind of model. We don't need to know what goes on inside that model. And we've got some data. We want to create a model that can recognize, let's say, a picture of a cat. We'll give it a lot of data pictures of cats that we know are pictures of cats. And we'll say, given this picture, we want you to say this is a cat. We'll also give it a lot of data that is not of cats. So we'll give it some dogs or some other things, just to, so it's got some sort of reference point to be able to say, is this a cat or is it not a cat? Once we've trained the system or the model, we can then give it an image that it hasn't seen before, something completely new. And we want it to tell us, is this a cat or not? So this is kind of this most simple, basic idea of machine learning. So that seems really cool. What can we use machine learning for? Well, you as a developer, you might use it for classifying objects in an image. So like the previous slide, you've got a picture of a cat. You want the machine to be able to tell you this is a picture of a cat. Maybe the location of an object in an image. So where is that cat in the image? Maybe you want to crop out the background or something. Natural language processing, just things like chatbots or uh, you know, understanding natural human language, recognizing and generating sounds. So when you tell Alexa that you want it to do something, Alexa needs to be able to understand what you're actually saying. And another one that's often overlooked is uh, forecasting structured or tabular data. So if we have an Excel spreadsheet of the last 10 years worth of financial data for our company, can we predict what next year's financials are going to look like based off of that? So when you go to Google and you say, how do I get started with machine learning? You want to try all of this really cool stuff. It's going to tell you that you're going to need to get yourself an NVIDIA graphics card. Um, you're going to have to get one with as many cores as possible. And it's maybe just worth noting, because not, not a lot of people know this, or let's say some people don't know this. What, what is the link between a graphics card and machine learning? Because a lot of people are like, isn't this for gaming? Like, Why would you want this for machine learning? Yes, and, and a bunch of other stuff. So it so turns out that graphics cards have a lot of cores. So your, your PC's got like four or eight cores or something. That graphics card's got almost 3,000 cores or something. I wrote it down. 4,992 cores in it. They're not very powerful cores, but they can all work at the same time. So it's really good at doing parallel programming. And it turns out that machine learning's got a lot of the same sort of algorithms or things that can run really well in parallel. So that's why graphics cards are really good for machine learning. So you're going to need to get yourself self one of those, plus $120 for shipping. You're going to need a lot of data to train your thing on. So um, a very popular uh, data set called ImageNet, which they train a lot of things, has got almost 1.2 million, more than 1.2 million images in it. Uh, you're going to need a lot of time. You're going to have to train this thing over weeks and months. And you're going to need a lot of specialist knowledge to kind of put this model together and figure out how it actually works. Sorry to interrupt. How big is that data set at the moment? Which one? Sorry? ImageNet. Yes. How big is that data set at the moment? 
Yeah. Well, no idea. That's a good question, though. <laughs> um, feel free to ask questions during the talk, by the way. Uh, all right, so this is all good and well. And a lot of people kind of look at this and they think, well, I don't have a PhD in machine learning. My maths was never really that good. I'm not using dialogue. I'm not going to be able to do machine learning. <laughs> And they, they kind of just like move off into something else. Or I've seen a lot of people use like the, the provided cloud services. Everyone's using the, the sort of drag and drop interface on the web. And they're like, yeah, I'm doing machine learning. And like, it's really cool. And it is cool. <laughs> but we can do a lot more than that. Because when you start using something like Angular or React, you don't immediately start digging into how the inner workings of React works. You don't think, wow, I really want to know how React hooks are actually doing that you know, under the hood. You don't dig into the source code. You don't go and like learn how all the other 20 frameworks before that were made. When you go to the React website, there's like a little one pager that tells you this is how you get started with React. This is how you get started with, with Angular. You use some command line tool. So actually, all you really need to get started with machine learning is about 14 lines of HTML and JavaScript. Now, some of you are thinking, like, hang on. You just talked about like training stuff on graphics cards and really big data sets. I don't see any data sets there. Well, the cool thing is, if I just go back to this picture over here, it turns out the really hard stuff is all over here. It's training. Doing this side of the thing is actually not that difficult. Once we've got a trained model, we can reuse that model. And it's quite easy to do. We don't need graphics cards, fancy things, lots of data. We can use it like any other JavaScript library. Uh, so what does that, those 14 lines actually look like? I'm going to load it up here. Can everyone see that? Make it a bit bigger. All right, so we've got an image over there of a cat. I don't know why people use cats for these things. And it's given us a label at the bottom. It says it's a tabby cat. We've even got like the type of cat. So let's dig into that code a little bit. Is that clear for everyone? OK, so the very first line, we're importing something TFJS. We're importing TensorFlow. Now, TensorFlow is a machine learning framework um, which was originally written by Google. It's open source. And it was designed to do a whole bunch of machine learning thing. It gives you lots of utilities to do machine learning. We don't really need to know anything other than we should just import it. <laughs> TensorFlow JS is actually a JavaScript implementation of that. Um, so they, they created something to do machine learning in the browser. And um, it's, it's not a full port of TensorFlow. So the original TensorFlow is written in Python. And you'll find a lot of researchers and like really hectic uh, machine learning people will, will use the, the Python version of it. But the JavaScript one has the really cool thing that you can just import it from a CDN, which you can't really do with, with the Python versions. So another very important difference uh, between TensorFlow and TensorFlow.js is TensorFlow interacts with your graphics card by using a library called CUDA, uh, which is proprietary NVIDIA stuff. And no one else has really come close to the sort of market participation as NVIDIA. So you're restricted to NVIDIA graphics cards, which kind of sucks because things like Macs don't really come with NVIDIA graphics cards. And even when a laptop does come with an NVIDIA graphics card, it's not really powerful. What TensorFlow.js does is it still uses your graphics card, but it makes use of something called WebGL. Has anyone heard of WebGL before? People tend to use it when they make like a really flashy website or they're trying to run like video with weird codecs and things. And it's essentially an API inside the browser that allows you to run certain things on the graphics card. But WebGL doesn't depend on any particular type of graphics card. It can use whatever graphics card you've got on your system. So as long as your phone or your computer supports um, hardware acceleration, you'll be able to do all of your complicated matrix multiplication and stuff inside your browser. You're not going to get the same kind of speeds that you would get using CUDA but it'll still be way faster than if you're just doing it on the CPU. OK, so the second thing that we're importing there is something called MobileNet. Yes, question? Would you say WebGL is the same as OpenGL? I think they have similar implementations. They're not the same. Um, I know some browsers support OpenGL. Some support WebGL. I don't know if TensorFlow supports OpenGL or not. If you don't understand, I use three Sorry? 
JS is uh, simpler to Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. So, so the second thing we're importing there, you can see it comes from a package called TensorFlow Models, and it's called MobileNet. And MobileNet is something that they created. I think it was the, the researchers from Google created. And it is a model that's been pre-trained on a subset of the ImageNet images. I don't know if it's all of them. There's at least 1,000 different categories inside there, uh, probably close to a million different images. And they've got this thing down into like a couple of megabytes worth of model that we can reuse, which is really cool. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what they have inside. Uh, these are the sort of examples of things that they have. We've got gazelles. Uh, there's a lot of animals in here for some reason. Um, minivans, go-karts, cradle, daisies. So these are kind of like common things that you would find, common objects. Um, it's not, there's no people in here, so it's not going to be able to detect this person versus that person. Uh, but it's really good with animals, and it's usually really good with, um, uh, with common objects. All right, so I'm just going to break off quickly to show you what other models they have inside the TensorFlow.js models. So there's a list of them there. There's about eight of them. I'm going to show you some examples of a couple of them. Uh, one of them that's quite interesting is that it was actually only added yesterday is this toxicity one. And the idea of this model is it can take text, typically like a comment from the internet, and it can tell you if there's any toxic language in there. So we're talking about like profanities, things that are offensive to people, uh, sexist, racist, things like that. So once we've imported MobileNet, uh, we're going to need an image. We've got an image tag over there, which I've just gotten a long hair tabby jar jar from Wikimedia. Um, I just Googled for that. And then I've got an H1 with the description that we're going to populate. What we're then going to do is, once our image is loaded up, we need to make sure that it's actually fully downloaded first. We're going to load our model into memory by calling mobilenet.load. This API is all documented on, on the model wiki page. And we only need to load it once into memory. Once it's loaded, we can do lots of classifications off of it. And we can then say, classify the image, and it's then going to give us back some predictions. And I'm logging out a few predictions there. I just want to show you what that looks like. It's an array of three things. We've got tabby cat, which is the first one, ping pong ball, and computer mouse. Clearly, those three things are all in that picture. No, not really. So, so why on earth would it give us these random classes when it's like it's it's clearly a cat, but it's giving us other things? Yes. So it's returning another number to us. Probability. Now, probability is a value between zero and one. You can think of it as like a percentage if you just multiply by a hundred. And what the model does is it gives us the top three. So it's 82.9 percent sure that this is a cat which is a good thing. That's quite a high number. It's only 6% sure that it's a ping pong ball. Maybe, maybe it sees that white thing in the background and thinks that's part of a ping pong ball. And it's only 1.5% sure it's a computer mouse. So what's actually happened is it's given us the top three probabilities. But it's still done pretty well in determining this is, in fact, a cat. And these things are not in the image at all. But they just happen to be the highest probabilities that came out. All right, and then once we get our predictions, we're just going to take the first one, because the first one in the array is always going to be the highest, and I'm just going to set it on the UI. And that's how that demo works. So I talked a little bit about why it's useful to do machine learning in the browser, because you have access to WebGL. But another really good advantage of this is that you are close to the sensors on the device. We're doing computing on the edge, as they like to call it. And what this means is that we're really close to the webcam. We're really close to the accelerometer. Uh, light sensors, things on your phone or your computer that you would not normally be able to have access to directly if this stuff was running on a web server somewhere. So let me show you another example. And what I've done here is I have connected it up to this webcam. 
And instead of just taking a static image, it's constantly taking a feed from the webcam, and it's passing it through the model to try and check what's happening. And you can see that how fast the model is working is determining the frame rate of this video. So it's doing pretty well. And it works pretty, pretty well on like small objects that are common. Wine bottle, maybe. Pop bottle. Not sure, iPod maybe, almost. <laughs> Notebook computer, everyone recognizes a Mac, right? <laughs> Coffee mug is apparently also a very recognizable shape. All right, so it's busy, it's busy looking for things inside, the, inside mobile net, and it's returning the one with the highest probability. But you also notice something different about this, is it's, it's saying not sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me open up the code for that and, and, uh, and just show you what I'm doing. OK, so it's, it's very similar to the other one. I'm setting up the webcam, though. And like all good code, it has a while true loop in it. And this while true is continuously pulling data from the webcam. And what it's doing is it's checking if our probability is greater than 50%. Now, why are we doing that? I'm doing that because when you point this thing at something that's not in the database, it's going to give you an answer. It's not very confident about that answer, but it's going to give it to you. And when you point this at somebody and it says, it thinks it's a popsicle. People tend to get offended. <laughs> and I mean, the AI, it's, it's not even saying like, you know, you definitely look like a popsicle. It's kind of like, eh, 2% popsicle. But people just, they're like, what? I'm not a popsicle. <laughs> so that's why it's always a good idea to kind of filter out these things and just be aware of what the, the models are actually giving you. And, and on, I mean, the other thing is to realize what this data is trained on. You need to know whether it's been trained on the correct objects um, for, for what you're classifying. I talked earlier about object detection. So this is something that uh, uses a, a similar model. But what it does is and you'll see it's taking a little while, is it scanning through the entire image to look for objects. So what it does is it creates a little box um, and takes the top left-hand corner, and it goes kind of pixel by pixel, and it scrolls across the whole image, and then says, do I recognize anything in this image? And that's obviously quite a slow way of predicting things, so you wouldn't be able to do this on a webcam very easily. But if you had a static image where you wanted to pick out things like a kite, person, stuff like that, um, it's, uh, it's quite an easy way to, uh, to pick out stuff. OK, so I'm going to move on to um, possibly my, my favorite pre-trained model. I'll let you guess from what you see what, what you think it does. And maybe based off of the name, you might guess. a while. There we go. OK, who can guess what this is doing? OK, this is called PoseNet. And what it does is it detects people, and it tries to detect what pose they are in. <laughs> And what's quite cool is this, is this is quite an accurate network. Like, I mean, you can see it, it works pretty well. Um, but let me walk you through some of the code for this quickly. OK, so we're importing PoseNet instead of MobileNet up there. That's kind of the only difference in our imports. We still need TensorFlow as the underlying framework. We've got a video element and a canvas element. And we've got a whole lot of numbers. And at this point, you're thinking like, whoa, OK, what do these numbers mean? This seems complicated. All right, so I copied all of these numbers. They are the defaults that came off of the readme. But most of them, the name kind of explains what they do, right? So flip horizontal. If it's a selfie cam, you want to flip it, because people want mirror images, apparently. Uh, image scale factor is an interesting one. So this is an HD webcam. It's got quite a, a high res image that it's feeding in. 
obviously the larger the images that you're feeding into the model, the slower it's going to be. So what we're doing is we're scaling it down by, by a factor of half. Max pose detections. So this thing won't detect more than six people at a time. We can increase that number, and I'm quite keen to try that just now with a large group of people, but it's probably going to be quite slow, right? Because it's going to have to detect a lot more people. Um, min pose confidence, so when it thinks there's a pose, what is the kind of minimum amount of probability that we want before we say, okay, this, this is actually not a pose, it's just <coughs> something else. So pretty much all of these uh, parameters are a trade-off between accuracy and speed. And depending on your use case, you're going to need to tweak these. And that's why they haven't hard-coded them into the library. There isn't an optimal setting for these. It depends on your use case. All right, so similarly, similar to MobileNet, we're going to uh, call posenet.load, which will load it into memory. We'll call this detect poses in real time. And once again, we've got a while true loop and we're calling estimate multiple poses. So it's also got estimate single poses. Uh, if you only are going to have one person in your image, it'll be a lot more accurate, but then weird stuff might happen if you've got multiple people. So th there's different architectures that they, they have for the PoseNet, and it's also a trade-off between speed and accuracy. Um, so the default one that they have is 0.75. I don't know why they gave it numbers as opposed to strings because it's, it's like specific numbers. It's like 0.75 and like 1.25. You can't just choose a random number and put it in there. Maybe but it's like a speed up factor so you can speed it up for like one and a half times or something like that. Maybe, yeah. So all of this stuff is documented in the, the API. So when you kind of use this and things start going wrong, then you can go and read up and start adjusting the parameters. All right, cool. So we can say draw pose to context. I've just made a little helper method. That's what's drawing the little blue dots um, on the key points. So what happens is it returns a list of key points, which is things like left eye, right eye, uh, left ear, right ear, things like that. And the cool thing about that is once you know where the left ear and the right ear are and the left eye and right eye, so you can start doing things like Snapchat filters. Give it a minute. So you can start detecting like where is the person's face and draw a hat just above where the face is. <laughs> okay, so maybe it needs a bit more work to get it accurate and a little bit smoother, but that was like 10 lines of code. So there's another pre-trained model called speech commands. I'm going to load it up so long. And this model has got a pre-trained vocabulary of speech that it can recognize. This is the list of things that it knows. The top two things, background noise and unknown. Background noise is just like random noise that it's been pre-trained on. They trained it on background noise. There was some guy who sat there recording background noise, apparently. Um, unknown is me means that it's detected that somebody said a word, but it's not in its vocabulary. And uh, then it's got all of the numbers, directions, and you will notice that it is busy spitting out stuff because it is busy recognizing numbers in the essentially background noise that I'm busy saying now. So it still kind of works. If I say one, two, two, Three. All right, so it kind of works, but it's giving us a lot of false positives. And the only reason I can think for this is probably because whatever use case they were using it for, they would rather have lots of false positives than not detect things at all. You'll also notice I'm busy printing out what word it thinks it is there, along with the probability of what it thinks it is. And I've also come to the conclusion that this thing works a lot better with American accents. My American accent is not very good, so I'm not going to try it, but I encourage you after the talk to maybe come and give it a go. So what can we do with stuff like this? Well, you can make some pretty cool games uh, and have a new way of interacting with the browser. So technically, you could play voice-controlled snake. Up, left, down, down, <laughs> down. <laughs> so you need to be more American. Right. 
suddenly open up a whole new way of being able to interact with the web browser. Something I was just reinforce in case it wasn't clear. All of this stuff is running on the browser. There's nothing that's happening on the server anywhere. I'm, I'm literally running this just as like a, a local served um, file system. Like there, there's no server that's doing any of this stuff. It's happening in the browser. OK, so now we've seen that that one's maybe got a couple of problems. Maybe it's not usable for what we need. It's got a limited vocabulary. It also doesn't recognize all of the objects that we might have around us. Now, a library is only really useful if we can extend it, right? But if we want to add a new class to, to be able to recognize this stuff, we don't want to have to go and retrain stuff and go buy a graphics card from Amazon that's going to cost us like $1,000. So how can we do this without retraining the whole model from scratch? So it turns out that uh, there's a technique called transfer learning, uh, which some people figured out which allows us to, to kind of do that. So this is a, a simplified view of what a neural network looks like. You don't need to understand what's happening here. I'm just kind of using it as a shape to try and uh, prove a point. But essentially what happens is when we feed in our picture of a cat, it goes into the input layer, and it goes through a number of other layers where lots of maths is happening, lots of weird things going through all of these different layers. But eventually when it gets to the output layer, this is an example of a network that could recognize four different categories. So maybe this one would give us the probability that it's a cat. This is the probability that it's a dog. This is the probability that it's, I don't know, beer bottle, something like that. So what, what they've found actually is that w these layers look for different things. And the layers on the far left start picking out small edges inside images. So this is examples of what um, those layers would look for. As you start moving more to the right, you start picking up a combination of edges to form a texture. And then you set, start getting a combination of textures to form patterns. And eventually you start getting to something called parts. And I don't know if it's fully clear here, but it looks as though you know, we're, we're kind of looking for something that looks like a flower over there, or we're kind of looking for something that looks like dog noses over there. And then eventually you get to full-on objects, which is the final layer. The, the really cool thing is, is that these objects are just made up of a sum of parts. And in fact, all objects are, even ones that are not inside the network. So what we can do is take this final output layer and kind of just ignore it and say, well, we just want to take stuff from the layer just before that and feed it into our own output layer. By doing that, we're creating our own classification set of a bunch of parts. The rest of the network is still really good. It's trained on 1.2 million images. Like It's really good at what it's doing. It's just not detecting the specific objects that we need. All right, this sounds too good to be true, and it sounds very magical. So how, how would we do this? Well, let's start with a demo. All right, so what I've got here is the same webcam stream that's being fed through the model. And you'll see it says that there's nothing trained yet. So my final layer has got zero items in it. All right, so let's train something on it. Now, just a caveat here is you're going to want to train it on images that are at least kind of similar to the images that the rest of the layers were trained on. If I point this now at like medical x-rays or satellite images, it's probably not going to do so well, because it was trained on mostly side-on images of everyday objects. Cool. So let's give it something to recognize. The first thing I'm going to start with is Richard. And I'm going to give it maybe 10 or 15 images. I'm going to want to move around a little bit just so it gets some variation. Get my good side, my bad side. <laughs> All right, so 15 images is way below the number of images that the, this network was originally trained with. But it gives us pretty good accuracy, as I'll show you now. So it's only got one thing in there now. Uh, which is Richard, so everything looks like Richard because it's the only output that it has. <laughs> so let's add something else so it's got something to compare against. Okay, so once again, we're going to train it with 10 or 15 images of the bottle, a couple of different angles. Does anyone know why it's important to get a couple of different angles and not just give 15 
images that are all identical. Bit of variance in the training set, right? Yeah, so if they're all the same, it's only going to recognize it exactly like that. If, it, if it's got some sort of variance, then it starts learning, okay, it's, it's not always going to look exactly like that. It's going to look slightly different. Cool, so now it should be able to tell the difference between a bottle and between Richard. Yeah, so, so that's a good question. Would it be able to recognize it like this? Yeah. yeah, it still does it. It's pretty good. Can it still recognize me? All right, cool. That's good. <laughs> okay, let's try a mug. Cool, now we should be able to have mug, bottle, Richard. Cool, let's take a look at the code behind this because this looks quite magical. Uh. Okay, so we're importing TensorFlow, and we're also importing MobileNet. Because remember, we're going to use all of the previous layers of MobileNet. We're only getting rid of the last layer. And in fact, we're not even getting rid of it. We're just ignoring the output from it. We're also going to use something called a KNN classifier, which is a K nearest neighbors algorithm, which you don't need to know anything about because I know very little about it. But it's really easy to use. So when we click the train button, we're going to get the label from the text box. And we're going to call this add training example function. And what that does is it's going to take this classifier, which is our KNN classifier, and it's going to say add example. The class ID is what it got from the text box. The activation we're pulling from the model. So previously we said model.classify. Now we're saying model.infer. We're also passing it a string called confpreds. Now, I think there's 19 different layers inside this model. They've all got names, which is a string. So we're pulling out confpreds, which I think is like the second last one or third last um, layer inside the model. And we're saying, pull out the weights that come out of that. So that's the parts thing. We're not looking for full objects. We're just looking for parts. And pass it to our classifier, and now train our classifier with this. And that's what this add example does. Once it's added to the classifier, it's essentially trained. Then inside our, our loop, what we're going to do is instead of calling classify on our model again, we're going to pull out the activation from that confpreds layer. And we're going to say classifier.predict class and pass that activation. And it's going to give us one of those classes that comes out of that classifier. So an easy way to think of this is um, <coughs> I, I thought of explaining it like this, but I'm not too sure if it's the right way to explain it. It's like the new object that we've trained, when you point the, the, the camera at initially, it's going to say, OK, it's maybe like 50% ping pong ball, 20% chair. I'm not really sure what it is. But we're essentially saying, if you see something else that's 50% ping pong ball, 20% chair, 10% popsicle, then just call it something different. It's kind of like that. OK, so a couple of things to, to look at if this interests you. These examples are all on my GitHub repo over there. The TensorFlow pre-trained models are at the second URL over there. Uh, the third one is a blog post. It's quite a lengthy blog post. Uh, but it explains machine learning in simple terms. And I found that very useful, because a lot of stuff on the internet has got jargon and maths and complicated things. This is also quite an entertaining read. So uh, I encourage you to look at that. And if you really want to step up to the next level, I encourage you to, to take a look at that online course over there, Practical Deep Learning for Coders. Uh, it is in Python rather than in JavaScript. But a lot of the stuff kind of translates into the JavaScript environment. And you'll be able to reuse a lot of it. Cool, that is the end of my presentation. Any questions?